Todd has a booming business. He's been on Netflix. He has one of the top 10 gyms in America. Drew Brees is his client. Like this guy's <laughs> killing it. I emailed him, cold email. Hey, Todd, my name's Clay Manley. Introduced myself and said, I love your stuff. I understand your voice. I'm a writer. You don't have enough content. Don't pay me a dime. I'll write for you. Well, Todd responded in five <laughs> seconds. This sounds great. Absolutely. Do your thing. On today's episode of Rise, Grind, Repeat, we talked to Clay, who went from corporate America to starting his own copywriting business. And well, all we talk about is copy, copy, copy. Let's dive right in. Clay, thank you so much for uh, joining on another episode of Rise, Grind, Repeat. I'm uh, super pumped for this. You know, we got connected through an old uh, baseball teammate, um, connected for an hour and feel like uh, made a best friend in less than 60 <laughs> minutes. And, Absolutely. Uh, you know, learn more about you. I mean, just the whole copy side of things when it comes to marketing, I personally think that is it is undervalued. Everyone is putting so much more attention now on videos and imagery and all that, which does a good job at getting the attention but I think that once you have the attention, they go up and read the copy, which is what drives the actual sale. So I, I'm excited to kind of hear your journey and, and just get some tidbits on on how to make better copy um, on the branded side and, and sales side before we get in there. Yeah, I'd say music to my ears because not everyone feels the same way you do. <laughs> but when I look at it, one, every creative is unbelievable. So mm -hmm. video guys, media guys, all that good, not blasting anybody. <laughs> but when you look at copy, it's probably the only form that can stand alone. Mm -hmm. And then also, I don't see videos, for example, producing sales unless there's copy with them. Yeah, exactly. What does that CTA button say? Mm -hmm. What does everything it's wrapped with say? How about the script for the video? Um, so to your point, I think people just forget about copy mm -hmm. and think it's old school. And it's kind of like, I'll use an analogy, it's kind of like direct mail. Like yeah. Direct mail can work right now. Is it old school? Sure. Is it disruptive because it's old school? Yes. So to me, <laughs> copies everything and I'll go on and on for days and you'll have to kind of yank me off. But I love copy. <laughs> awesome. No, I love to hear that. And before we get more into, you know, advice and all that, we'd love to hear your story. What is, you know, how did you get into where you're so passionate about copy and kind of what does that entrepreneurial journey look like? Yeah. So for me, um, it's, it's a shock. I never was like into copy, didn't even know what copy meant <laughs> until I got into it. But way back when I grew up in Illinois, I was into fitness. So when I got out of college, I was a fitness manager. Um, as you can imagine, running fitness centers is a grind and there's not much money in it. So for me, it really wasn't the future. While I was managing fitness centers, I started a fitness blog. I was like, I'm a pretty good writer, could write naturally. Yeah. My blogs got a little bit of traffic, but I was also stabbing in the dark. I really didn't know what I was doing other than spending nights and weekends at a community college library <laughs> writing. Yeah. Sure enough, blog gets acquired, which sounds way more impressive than it is. I made a little bit of money, <laughs> but the startup that acquired me was in California and they offered me a full-time job to come on as a content coordinator. So I quit my job, bought a one-way ticket, shipped my car, wow. moved to Orange County, California. The startup at the time was doing fairly well. They had just brought in a few million in funding, but they were truly a startup. Yeah, I was, we'll say employee somewhere between like 10 and 12. And I came in, lived on the floor of a shared home to make ends meet with these guys. I had a mattress on the floor of a room that had a built-in desk, like covering the boundary of the room. <laughs> so it was like desk, wow. mattress, me. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm in California, which is way better than Illinois. <laughs> and we're going to try this thing out. Company grew rapidly. We brought in four million real quick after I joined. I had nothing to do with it, but that's just what happened. And we had to grow. So when I came on, this company had a sports website that was doing well. Mm -hmm. They acquired me to help launch a men's lifestyle website. That's cool. And we launched 13 other verticals. Wow. So we went into women's lifestyle. We went into cars. We went into gaming. Really, <clears throat> anything that was popular at the, on the internet at the time, we went into. We also had to grow the team. I was the only person with management experience. <laughs> and they were like, you can write. That's why we hired you. Yeah. So I hired a bunch of writers. Ended up having a full-time team of about nine. And I was managing literally hundreds of blogs wow. going out every day because we had 200 plus contractors too. So did I really know copy at the time? No, but talk about a crash course. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so this, this startup ended up getting acquired. 
kind of at the 11th hour as things were going downhill. But for me, it was just a invaluable education worth way more than the millions we brought mm -hmm. in, right? From there, I went to a company called Preferred Hotels and Resorts. They do global hotel marketing, essentially luxury boutiques that don't have the budget of like a Hyatt or a Hilton yeah. pay this company to do their marketing. So I was writing about these awesome hotels around the world, um, places like in Nicaragua, where um, <clears throat> celebrities come in on helipads or come in on helicopters yes. and land on helipads, right? <laughs> I'm like, I can never afford this, but it's darn good writing. Yeah. So I'm like, now I've got sports, I've got fitness, I've got all these other verticals, and I've got this hotel side. Where else can this go? Well, I crossed paths with kind of my idol in the fitness industry, Todd Durkin. He ended up hiring me as his director of marketing. It's like, this is cool. Yeah. I've always wanted to work for this guy. Um, so I got back into fitness in the marketing end and something wasn't right. And I told you this earlier, but it wasn't the right fit for me or for Todd. And the reason I say his name is because a lot of people, at least in that industry, know Todd. Yeah. So they'll understand the authority there, but it just wasn't right for either one of us. And looking back, what I now realized the problem was, was I was doing marketing, not copyright. Yeah. And those are two very different things. So I quit on my own a few months in and I took my first stab at freelancing. I was charging like $20 an hour and begging for <laughs> clients, also doing a lot of free work, which yeah. has been a big part of my path. And um, I did that for about a year. And then I landed at Petco and not Petco Park, Petco the stores, like the retailer. <laughs> and there I came on right away and managed all the copy and content for their private label brands. So you look at a company like Petco, they have, we'll say 15 brands. Wow. And when you walk into a store, really don't say Petco on them, but are owned by Petco. All those brands need copy and content. So that was me. I had a team, got promoted pretty quickly, took over packaging design too. Dang. So a creative like you yeah. can respect that. Yeah. So it was like, I've got the copy, I've got the content, I've got the packaging design. Um, for those that don't speak marketing, that means me and my team were writing everything going on packaging. We were writing what was going in the stores on signage. We were writing scripts for internal trainings and store yeah. partners. I was working with an in-house creative team to create videos and photography and things like that. Hell of a job. Yeah. Under my leadership, we crossed 1 billion in sales for private label brands. Jeez. Now that's a heavy statement, but <laughs> all I will say is the copy correlates. It's yep. not that I'm the reason that happened. Yeah. The copy correlates. And that allowed me to feel like, you know what? I have the authority now. I've been through the grind of the startup, the mid-sized business, like the hotel company, and now this huge corporation. Like, what am I doing? I can do this on my own. Yep. And copy is what I'm passionate about. It wasn't going to the video shoots. It wasn't leading the photography. Um, it wasn't the meeting after meeting after meeting in the corporate <laughs> you don't enjoy those? Not at all. <laughs> For me, it was really the copy. So... I think there, I, I just, at Petco, my last gig, I really realized the value of copy, realized how good I was at it. Now mm -hmm. that I've managed over 200 writers, including professionals making good salaries in a corporate atmosphere, I was like, in my opinion, I'm the best of the bunch and I can do this on my own and I can do it better yeah. than just about anybody else. Um, and so I left Petco just about a month ago. Um, just about a month ago, I turned in my two weeks, called it quits. I had used COVID and short-term furloughs to line up some business. Nice. So while others were, uh, and I don't want to blast anybody, but what I'll say is when I would, when we would come back from furlough, so we would have these occasional weeks off yeah. where you're still an employee, but you don't have work. Yeah. You're not getting paid for that week, but your job's secure. Um, we'd come back and, and our big team would get together in a group meeting and you'd hear people instantly talk about what they watched on Netflix, uh -huh. current events what they did with their friends, what bars they went out to yeah. because they had patio seating. And I'm like, I went and did a business building retreat <laughs> and spent that week grinding every hour of the day, mm -hmm. working up at five or waking up at 5 a.m. to work, going to bed at 9 p.m. after work to build something better. So that's when I was like, this definitely isn't for me. And to go back to copy, copy was what was allowing me to do that. Yeah. I was picking up clients and I was offering copywriting services. So now I'm on my own and I'm doing all sales copy. And like we talked about at the beginning, man, I just think copy opens so many doors. There's copywriters everywhere. 99% of them can't write sales copy. Hmm. So that's where I come in. And to me, it's the copy that gets ROI. That's really the yeah. difference. I, there's so much I can appreciate in, in there. Um, 
We'd love to get into the free work um, here in a second. But the thing I can appreciate out of everything that you're, you're mentioning is that, you know, you've come in after you've come in, there's been big changes in terms of growth and that it's not you don't attribute it to that one single thing. And I think that's the big thing that a lot of business owners miss or people that are trying to do their marketing. It's they think that one individual tactic or thing is going to do it. It's a culmination of all of it working together. The the script of the video, once you have the attention, the copy there, the calls to actions, when they land on the, it's, it's a combination of everything and a team working together. Um, and that's, I, yeah, I love that. But getting into the the free work, I absolutely love that you mentioned that because a lot of, I mean, the the videos, the there's been a lot, like my background is the paid media, but, you know, do SEO, we do video, but it's, you know, the, lot, the last two years, it's been a lot of learning. To expedite that learning, it's easier to get someone to say yes whenever you're like, hey, we'll do it for free. <laughs> How has that helped shape your path to where you are today? So the free work has been, um, it's been a big door for me it, that opens up more doors. You go through and more come, right? So um, for me, looking back when I was building my own blog, that was free work. Mm -hmm. I didn't make any money on that. And I was spending nights and weekends at the local community college after my full-time job, which was a grind, mind you, doing that for free. So boom, learning experience, also proving yourself. Yep. Uh, later on, I told you I connected with a guy who's famous in the fitness industry, Todd Durkin. Todd has a booming business. He's been on Netflix. He has one of the top 10 gyms in America. Drew Brees is his client. Like this guy's <laughs> killing it. I emailed him, cold email. Hey, Todd, my name's Clay Manley. Introduced myself and said, I love your stuff. I understand your voice. I'm a writer. You don't have enough content. Don't pay me a dime. I'll write for you. Well, Todd responded in five seconds. <laughs> this sounds great. Absolutely. Do your thing. Yeah. And so that's what I did. And, and for me, that name alone opened a lot of doors. So I would encourage other people, um, like anyone, anyone who's bigger than you in your industry or a brand you want to work mm -hmm. with or a business you want to work with, an entrepreneur, an influencer, offer them free work. It's, it, it really... It's easy on you in a sense because there's no pressure. Yeah. That's the difference. Yep. The difference is there's no pressure. I didn't feel like anything I write I write it. <laughs> anything I I didn't feel anything I wrote for Todd yeah. required ROI. I felt like I'm proving to him that I can do this. Yeah. I'm proving to myself that I can do this. And I'm practicing. Practice mm -hmm. makes perfect. You're a baseball guy. You know, I'm a basketball guy. I get it. It's, it's about the practice. And if you can do that practice in a no pressure situation, more power to you. You look good to others. You show your soft skills. You show your proactive. You show your care. And you get better and better and better. Yep. No, I couldn't agree more. And it's funny because so many people are like, well, I understand the value of my time. But to me, I'm like, and that's why they won't charge or they won't do anything for free. But to me, it's like, well, you don't value you know, your time because you know, without a portfolio, without people saying that you can do it, that's your, it's going to take longer to get more work. And so all you're doing is expediting, um, how quickly you can increase your prices and actually charge. And to your point, there's a lot more pressure when someone's actually paying for it. And it's like, you know, if you're just starting out, you're probably not going to get the tens of thousands of dollars that you want. So it might be 500 bucks or a thousand dollars. Is that $500 worth like worth the, the pressure and, and all that where it's like, you know, if you're open and transparent and be like, no, I'm trying to learn, I'm trying to do better. It's, it's all about that expectation setting up. And, uh, I, I think it's such a huge opportunity and more people need to be doing, um, you know, offering free work, especially at the beginning to those people that say, I appreciate my time and I'll never do free work. I mean, what, what do you have to say to them? Well, I think one free work is also free feedback mm -hmm. and it's free networking and it's free opportunities. So first off, change how you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing work for free, but the doors that could open could be huge and can open doors in ways you don't see right away. For those who say their time is valuable. Everyone's time is valuable. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have made it really far doing free work. Look at Gary Vaynerchuk. He <laughs> talks about it all the time, right? He's like, you do the free work, uh -huh. it will open doors. I think at the end of the day, and, and I don't always agree with this, but one of those sayings, like, it, it, you know, it is about who you know, not what you know. Yeah. Well, could free work build that network for you? Yeah. Maybe that's how you need to look at it. Maybe too, if you're young and you're hungry, maybe you don't need to spend I'm not encouraging this, but maybe you don't need to spend money on a degree. Maybe you don't need to spend money on extra courses. Maybe you need to spend money and time mm -hmm. on doing things for free to master your craft. So to me, um, look, would I do free work tomorrow? Absolutely not. Yep. I mean, not unless it's 
the perfect brand, the perfect opportunity. <laughs> and I feel like there's a near guarantee at yeah. the end of the road. But coming up, I wouldn't have got where I am without free work. Some of my best testimonials, mm -hmm. clients that I did free work for, some of the biggest names I've worked with, clients that opened doors from free work. So not to hammer it home too hard, but I, I think it just goes so much beyond the value of your time and more it's about like the value of your life. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's the the perspective of it because everyone thinks it's free because you're not getting anything monetarily. But if you're getting, you know, portfolio building, if you're getting education, that that that's valuable stuff, probably worth way more than the dollar or two that, that you're going to be charging for whatever it may be. And well, and I did, I'll give an example. I'll give a copy specific example. Mm -hmm. So there's a copywriting community, AWAI. It's Alliance of Writers and Artists, something like that. AWAI is what you need to know. Mm -hmm. They do a copywriting contest almost monthly, and you can make 200 bucks for writing a basically a fake email based <laughs> on some prompts they provide. Wow. So if you don't want to do free work, find a contest, find something you can enter, like find a way to make it worth your time. You mentioned it and you nailed it testimonials, free feedback, all that stuff is valuable. I think there's also resources out there in this day and age where you can find a way to have a shot mm -hmm. at earning money too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I love everything about that. And kind of getting into what I love that you mentioned is there's so many copywriters out there and a lot can do can tell great stories. I mean, can write really well, but there's a difference between writing copy just to storytell and one that actually drives sales. And that's what businesses are looking for. What is the difference between branded copy and sales copy? It's funny. I literally just recorded a video for my own Instagram really? answering that question because those are the two things I do. And it's a great question. So what's the difference between branded copy and sales copy? Sales copy is persuasive. Mm -hmm. Sales copy is designed to convert. Sales copy needs to make an action happen. And generally that action is tied to ROI. Branded copy is about a brand's tone and voice. It's about getting their personality or their message out there. So when I look at branded copy, that could be as simple as like the homepage of Petco's website. Yeah. But when we're talking sales copy, that's now the emails intended to promote something. Or if you look at a small business, their branded copy might be their customer service macros, the responses they send when customers inquire things. But the sales copy is now their emails. It can be intertwined in their blogs. It's their advertisements. You name it, that really is the difference. Now, one thing that I think is an important clarification is sales copy can be story based. That's that third piece that yeah. I think people miss. It's there's branded copy that's about personality and voice. There's sales copy that's about persuasion and conversion. And then there's also using story to sell, which is kind of a combination of both. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the word sells in there. So you should be persuading someone yeah. to take some sort of action. Yeah. And how do you, I mean, from your experience, how much does uh, that storytelling piece um, improve overall conversion rates? And I mean, um, overall sales, a lot of, a lot of recent guests, I mean, just huge on uh, storytelling and really um, that, that hero's journey. And uh, whenever they started doing more of that, they started seeing more sales come in. And so are you seeing that that is a, a major impact when it comes to uh, sales copy or is it 110%? If you look out front of your office here, you have the word disruptive on the wall. Story is disruptive. Story is different right now because so many writers cannot write story that sells. They just don't get it. It becomes an incoherent, jumbled mess. When you have a strong story based in strong sales copywriting, yeah. you can, I don't know, three to 10x your revenue or your sales because it's going to stand out. And I'll use another analogy. If you're looking at a movie, right? A movie is about a story. Mm -hmm. It has elements of storytelling, and it's what sticks in people's minds. You, me, and Andre could sit here and talk movies for a while. We could talk music. That's all based on story. Yeah. So that's how you stand out in a crowded market. You tell stories, and then that allows you to be disruptive, which then gets attention. We know attention equates to money if you do it right, yeah. and you use that attention to sell. I love it. So, I mean, without giving secret sauces away or anything like that, I mean, how, how do you approach that story? How, what are the components that, you know, someone should think about or uh, incorporate as they're thinking about, I'm about to write this ad or this email that I want to incorporate storytelling. I want to incorporate who I am. I want to basically drive more sales, but what is the process or what should someone think through um, when it comes to that storytelling? So you have to be wildly creative, mm -hmm. which not every copywriter is. <laughs> you have to be wildly creative because Every moment in your life can be flipped into a story that sells. That's what I believe. And you have to read it. You have to see it. You have to feel it. You can't just start doing this. 
Mm-hmm. So I would tell people, go follow someone like Ben Settle, who is a huge name and story for sales. Um, go look at AWAI. Look at how they're constructing these stories. And then start thinking about how you can do that in your life. So I'll give an example. I came in here. You and I talked on the phone Thursday. Today's mm-hmm. Saturday. we would never met before, never crossed paths. At least I don't think so. <laughs> but we were like instant friends. I'm going to flip that into a story that sells something. I don't know how right yeah. now, but that's a moment I'm going to remember. And maybe it's going to be about selling myself to you. And two days later, being on your podcast yeah. in your office. I'm not quite sure, but these moments happen and you can tie them into sales if you get creative. That's the name of the game. There's no secret sauce. It's literally about taking the stories of your life and flipping them into sales. And the best place to start is to look at people who are already doing it. Yeah, no, I can agree more. I mean, aspire to those that are doing and 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 take the learnings from them. Um, and I, I think you hit, you know, something really good is the creative side. Is that something that you can teach at all? Or is that kind of, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, for me, you know, I never considered myself creative. I remember mm-hmm. when I was at the startup, my first full time content gig, I was like, guys, I get management. I can write pretty good. I don't know about the creative piece. And now I consider myself very creative. So I don't know if it's a flip that switched or what. What I would say is I think for me, it came with experience and it came with rubbing elbows with true creatives. I think that I was in a mindset like my dad was military. My mom has been at the same job her whole life and it's a great job. And I was like discipline and sports. And I think I had to change my mindset to be open to people with other attitudes yeah. and other interests and that starts sparking creativity and then again the more i rubbed elbows with creatives i call them true creatives like real creative <laughs> yeah. people yeah. the more it rubbed off on me it's like you are who you surround yourself with mm-hmm. so i think it's the atmosphere and i think it's the people you're around and then also just opening your mind up to thinking differently because as creatives we think different mm-hmm. no couldn't agree more um and when it comes to just copy in general i mean there's there's something that that talk with a lot of clients with when I mean, even just ad copy or landing page copy, short versus long. Yeah. What what is there a better approach? Is there a, a, you know, when do you use longer copy? Um, So it's the same question that you get on what's the best time to send an email? (laughs) There's no best time. There's no right or wrong way. What I tell copywriters who write for me or who I outsource to is we need to test it because it depends on the audience. Some audiences are going to eat up long form copy like you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. Other audiences want quick, direct information. And if you send them something long, bye bye. So for me, it's about testing. It's about trying long form, trying short form, mixing up your subject lines, mixing up your approach and your leads and your CTAs and seeing what works. And I think that's where you and I are alike. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong is what are you actually testing? It's not just the subject line open rate, it's not just the conversion rate and the click through as a copywriter it's the style of copy you're writing mm-hmm. like you are your own test subject and so you should be trying both long form is going to be more sales folk or sorry more story focused so mm-hmm. long forms your stories short form is generally more promotional or more sales but again if you can do it right those long forms can be exciting to read people can look forward to it which doesn't happen much in inboxes <laughs> yeah. and they don't even know they're getting sold to. It's so natural that they're like, yeah, yeah, I need this because that story just captivated me. Yeah, no, I absolutely love that. And I love the the data and analytics and testing <laughs> part. I mean, we have something, uh, an acronym here, uh, ABT, and it stands for always be testing. No matter what, what piece of the, the journey, what, no matter what, what, you know, the overall aspect of the marketing strategy is, there are things to be tested. And to your point, I think, People are realizing that and doing more of it, but without an actual game plan. It's like, oh, we're testing the subject line. It's like, well, what are you testing? Is it the the call to action? Is it the the emotion that you're trying to convey? And and I think that's where, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. People are getting to do more testing, but not defining a solid strategy. Yes. That being said, you've worked at, you know, corporate gigs. You've worked, uh, you know, with mom and pops. Um, what how much has testing, you know, driven an impact in overall copy and just strategy in general? Those that are testing, are they seeing much bigger sales and, and ROI on, on everything that they're doing compared to those that don't? So I think when you look at businesses that are a little smaller and we'll use your and I's sweet spot of one to 20 million, 
if you aren't testing, you're not getting to the next level because mm-hmm. you're stabbing in the dark. Yep. So you might get lucky here or there, but you're not getting to the next level. I think when you look at bigger companies, and we'll use Petco since I was there as an example, they say they're testing, but it's such a big machine <laughs> that you have to wonder. Like, I'm not seeing any data. Mm-hmm. I'm not seeing results. I don't quite know what's going on. Um, and so they may preach it, but are they practicing it? I think the smaller you are, the more you need to be testing mm-hmm. or else you're dead in the water. I think when you get to a certain level, you should still be testing, but I don't know, is there too much to test? Is yeah. it too much analytics? Do you not have the people to sort through it? That's kind of the question. Um, but the short answer is on the smaller end or the one to 20 million, test, 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 and test yeah. some more. Yeah. No, just from our, our personal experience, those that are are testing more are seeing incremental growth quicker. Um, but to your point, once you start getting to that upper level, the the billion dollar companies, it's uh yeah, we're testing all the stuff, but there's no no defined plan. And it's what KPIs are we looking at? Why did we decide to test this? And it's it's I think again, being so data and analytics rich in today's world, everyone hears we got to test, but there's yeah. no solid strategy. And so let me add something on testing, and this is for the copywriters. You should have, let's say you're writing emails, you should have categories of subject lines you're testing. The business you're working with doesn't even need to know that you're doing it. <laughs> you ask them for the results and you know what categories are working. Same with your short form, long form. Mm-hmm. So I have eight to 10 categories of subject lines I always test and they're opposites. So we can A, B test one verse two and three verse four and five mm-hmm. verse six. And then inside of there, I'm also running my own little mastermind test, oh, I love like that. long form versus <laughs> short form. What does my lead look like? Where am I putting the CTA? How many times am I linking out? Like you need to be proactive and own that as the copywriter, because if you do that, you're now going to know what works Mm -hmm. and you now can flip that into more business and flip that into ROI and flip that into a true strategy that you can sell to others. I absolutely love it. So are there any other tips when it comes to copywriters specifically on how different things they can test when when they're approaching what they're doing? Yeah. So I think, you know, and we've touched on a lot of it, but long form versus short form is an easy way to start. Mm-hmm. So maybe you're you're going to do this email is going to be story based. I'm going to have a CTA at the end. Cool. This email is going to be super short, three, four sentences. And I'm going to have a CTA right away. We're going to see if they pound the buy button early or they pound it later. Yeah. Right. Um, subject lines. I pull from several categories. I'll give you just the very basics, blind and direct, blind, curiosity inducing. You're not quite telling them what they're going to get if they open it. Great for storytelling. Mm -hmm. Direct, very much a sales email. We're running this promotion. You can save this money. Benefit rich, short form copy. Test the two and see what happens. Blind versus direct. Easy, easy, easy way to do it. And it's not just email. You can do that with your blog headlines. You can do that with the subheads within your blogs. You can do that really in just about anything you're writing. Look at a a, um, video script at the beginning. You could be very direct or you can lead them in and be blind. Mm -hmm. As a writer, I like blind because it's fun. (laughs) But direct can work too. It really just depends on the audience. Yeah. No, uh, that's awesome. So with all this, I mean, you've worked, like I said, Big, small companies done tons of different testing. What's one experience that, that whether it's a campaign or a single email, that, that you just nailed it, loved it, and what were those results? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> so I'll give, you, I'll give you a few. Give you the first one would be, I recently worked with a clothing brand named West Major. Okay. New brand, uh, men's, men's Western shirts, we'll call them. And... This is a brand new brand. The owner literally quit his job and is bartending to build this thing. He's like stitching the patches on the shirt themselves. Right. So I love it. Maybe I shouldn't have said the name, but (laughs) I love this brand. I knew nothing about them. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we're at a stage where we need to build a brand book because we have no idea what we're doing with our (laughs) messaging. One conversation. I built this world around this little brand that I am so proud of and so want to live in, but I'm not cool enough. I'm not the audience, (laughs) but to be able to build a world Mm -hmm. is pretty special. And to me, that stands out because this was essentially taking a bunch of ingredients that are mismatched and maybe not ripe and not good and throwing them in a blender and pulling out something great and something magical and something unique and special. So that was one, I don't know the impact because that's brand copy yeah, and brand yeah. copy. It's tough to say, but I'll look at another one, um, which is one of my clients who's in real estate. Again, I knew nothing about real estate when I started working with this gentleman, he's got a team of 13. It's a very successful business. I'm going to guess 10 to 12, maybe 15 million a year. And they needed copywriting. 
and I came on and took on their biggest high ticket online program for training new real estate folks, yeah. we'll say wholesalers. And he looked at that sales page the week after I wrote it and he's like, how did you, how did you know all that? <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't. I researched forums. I got inside your audience's head. I figured out the psychology. I watched pretty much every piece of content you and your competitors have ever put out. <laughs> and I turned it into the words that sell. And he was so floored. And for me, that was so rewarding because he told me, even if this product doesn't sell, I know it's, the, it's not the copy. Yeah. It's anything but the copy. Yeah. And he's like, I now have a library of copy that I can pull from for every channel. He's like, everything you wrote is now influencing my social media. It's influencing <laughs> my emails, it's influencing my blogs. He's like, and frankly, it, it sounds better than I sound. Like, I don't know where you came up with this. So for me, that was really rewarding. And that opened up more doors with this particular client. And I started writing his emails and doing his blogs and really every piece of content he has. And he said to me, he now goes on podcasts and people are like, dude, your copy is the best in the industry. Cool. It's the coolest stuff we've ever seen. We've never heard anything like it. And he's like, I sheepishly have to be like, I didn't write it. <laughs> and I'm like, but it's in your voice. Yeah, Take that. Yeah. So for me, um, of course, he's getting sales. Uh, I'll give you an example. He's got a list of a few thousand. We did a sequence for a new program. First email, I did like a sneak preview where it was almost like a speakeasy. Mm -hmm. I was telling his audience they had to respond to him and say they're interested to get any more information on this new and exciting thing. Well, they got 30 replies. Wow. And nowadays, no one's really replying to emails. <laughs> yeah. And they said, I'm interested, which is exactly what they were supposed to. And they now have 30 leads from one email that was actually super short form and just a creative approach to a new product. So for me, it's rewarding in many ways. It's hearing the business owner, the entrepreneur, or the big wigs at the company yeah. saying they love the copy. It's them being able to repurpose the copy elsewhere. It makes their lives wildly easier. Mm -hmm. And it's them feeling like they sound like an authority. They sound how they want to sound, but they also know there's persuasive elements in there. From there, they should get results. The one thing I would say is I don't promise or guarantee any results because yeah. I don't know your list. I don't know your client. I don't control the images you put in that email. I don't control the videos. I don't control the alt text. There's so much that I don't have a part in. What I tell them is I can guarantee your copy is set up for success. Yeah. If you do the right things and you send it to the right list, you're going to be very happy with the results. Yep. No, I couldn't agree more. And that's, you know, as digital marketing grows, there's so many different components that drive success that it's not, again, it's not that single piece of copy. It's the copy that goes with the images on there. What are, you know, who is the list that we're sending it to? How are we distributing it? There, there's so many things that go into it, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome to hear Lot, lots of good wins, big wins. Um, that being said, you know, you're pretty early off in your entrepreneurial journey. I mean, as, as am I, what are, what is one big thing or hurdle that, that you've had to overcome and, and how'd you overcome it that just really like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get over this. Maybe I should just go back to full time or this is what I did and this is how I got over it. Great question. For me, it was stability. Mm -hmm. So work would come in and I wouldn't know how long it would last. I wouldn't know how long the relationship would be. And as a copywriter, instantly you have to learn the niche. So you are diving, if you're good, if yeah. you're as good as you say you are, you're diving deep into the psychology of the audience. You're scouring forums, you're scouring reviews, you're scouring competitors, you're scouring analog brands. You're spending so much time getting up to speed on what you're talking about in this research phase that if you don't have a long-term relationship with the client, you're definitely losing money. Yeah. So for me, the big flip was starting to put clients on long-term contracts and getting on board with all of their copy. So now when I take someone new on, there's either a bare minimum fee they have to pay mm -hmm. or there's a bare minimum term of the contract. So I feel I have some stability. Yeah. And that's a big difference from just doing hourly work. Right. Yep. So for me, that was a big flip. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's tough and we're literally going through the whole same thing where it's taking random projects, custom proposals all the time. But in terms of forecasting, it's tough to know what the future looks like, which then it's tough to make business business decisions today uh, that that's going to be right. And that that's the basic thing we're working on right now is to help whether it's those minimums, the contracts and all that, that stability so that we can forecast a bit more. You know, and I don't know if you've had this experience, but for me, it's also been strike while the iron's hot. If a client comes my way and I don't follow up right away, I feel like I'm not going to get that yeah. deal. And it's happened a lot where you're on vacation or you miss the email or you've got other priorities 
and you lose that opportunity and yeah. you don't know when the next one's coming. Yeah. So for me, anytime there's an opportunity with a new client, I'm quick to jump on it. Even if it means telling them, hey, I've got a waiting list. It's going to be a few weeks. I'm building that relationship right away. I'm taking the meeting and I'm getting to understand their business because to me, if I don't take advantage of it right then yeah. and there, I may lose that opportunity forever. Yeah. And what is that length of time? I mean, Nick mentioned short and that huge on that to me, it's especially if you're dealing with lead generation where it's phone calls or something like that. It's like you need to get back within seconds for every second that goes by that conversion rate down, 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 down. And as, as that conversion rate goes down, your profitability goes down as well. So, I mean, what what is that length of time? Well, I think people are fickle, right? So they uh -huh. change their mind. They find someone different. They hear, hear about something else. They get shiny object syndrome and they're on to the next product or person. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's same day. No matter what, it's at least yeah. following up on the same day and then getting a meeting as soon as possible yeah. because I believe in the human connection. Yeah. And if it's on Zoom or whatever, <laughs> it's making that happen ASAFP. So I go for same day. And if they want to meet on a Saturday or Sunday, for me, it's worth it. Um, and that's what's worked for me. I, my conversion rate is probably through the roof since doing that. Yeah, no, I love it. I mean, speed, it's, it's, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and really, you know, you, you're doing quite a bit now before we get kind of into the future, you've brought up psychology quite a bit. And I, I love this cause it's, I mean, I've seen so many different studies where it's like, I mean, this has nothing to do with copy, but they had, uh, they were selling diapers and they had, uh, they're looking at people's eyes and they had a little baby. One was looking up and then one was actually looking at the copy and literally 98% more people actually read the copy from the baby looking. Cause they go, where, where's the baby looking? Oh, there's the copy. Now I caught the attention and read. So those little nuances can make such a difference as you're trying to get into the psychology aspect. I mean, what is it that you're looking for? Is it the sentiment of the industry in general of that brand? I mean, what are all the different things that you're looking for to build that? psychology side of things so i think first there's to me three things that are essential elements of great mm -hmm. sales copy one gain two pain and three transformation gains easy it's what are they going to get yeah pain is a little bit deeper yeah. pains what are they going to avoid and then transformation is how is their world or their life going to change when you go beyond gain which is where everybody uh, starts yeah. and you get into pain and transformation you can convince people to buy and it doesn't matter if it's video copywriting mm -hmm. you name it and so for me it's how do i find their pains their insecurities their worries their stressors a lot of times that's in forums a lot of times it's googling questions around the industry and seeing how people are responding it's going on competitors blogs and looking in the comments it's reading books about the industry mm -hmm. or looking at the titles of those books which may be <laughs> answering the questions yeah. that they have it's reading reviews i'll look at reviews of books podcasts, anything that's similar in that industry. And I'll look at the one star and the five star reviews. The one star is going to tell me what does that audience hate or what is not working for them. Mm -hmm. And the five star is going to tell me what do they love. I'm going to work that into the copy. Suddenly I have pain and gain covered. And then transformation, you have to put yourself in the audience's shoes. And so you have to think like them. You mm -hmm. have to put yourself, you have to be to, able to creatively put yourself in their position and understand how they're feeling and then translate that to the written word. So I'll give you an example, and it's getting a little, it's staying in psychology, but it's a little different. But here's the example. If we're thinking pain, gain, transformation, look at water filters. Mm -hmm. The gain is get clean water. Okay. Yeah. The pain is never drink dirty water again. Now we're getting somewhere. The transformation is never worry about what's in your water again and feel confident that what you're drinking is safe for you and your family. So now suddenly I've gone from get clean water to this is about your health, this is about your safety, mm -hmm. this is about your family, and this is solving your worries and your stresses. That's the difference. That to me is where the psychology comes into play. I, I love that. I mean, immediately as you went through there, that, that last piece, <laughs> I was like, all right, I need one now. I mean, I got a little one on the way. Got, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, well, I'll, I'll do another one for you. Real estate, because we've mm -hmm. talked about it. So gain, pain, transformation. Gain, close more deals. Pain, never blow a deal again transformation, be a confident closer. Okay. So now you've got three levels here and every copywriter, every marketer gets the gain part, close yeah. more deals. Yeah. And once you get into never lose a deal again, that's powerful stuff. And then once you say you're going to become a confident closer, you're touching on those emotions yeah. that play into the psychology that get them to buy. And if you're really good, and I mean really good, you start stacking these things together. So let's take the pain and the transformation and let's say, become a confident closer so you never blow a deal again. 
Well, now you've got wow. a headline yeah. that's going to convert, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that I mean, that that is amazing. Uh, it, it is amazing what just a little piece of copy can do. Just I mean, in terms of just make conveying different emotion and that emotion is what drives someone to buy yeah and look you don't you know in video you've got music and you've got other cues to make that happen mm -hmm. when you look at copy what are your other cues i mean you do have photo and video worked in there but there's plenty of times where the copy stands alone yep. and that headline needs to be strong powerful and transformative and if it's not they're not going to bother with the video. They're not going to bother with the images. They're certainly not going to bother with the CTA button. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, it really is. It, it, it's gain, it's pain, it's transformation, and it's really hitting the second and the third home hard to kill the psychology. I love it. I love it. So you're helping a lot of a lot of brands, you know, get their voice out there, really drive sales. You're 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 helping brands quite a bit. What is it that you're doing for yourself? that uh you know is going to grow yourself the next six months what are the biggest things that you're working on now um and what are your biggest goals over the next six months great question so one was breaking free of corporate <laughs> that grind the pressure the feeling like a number was not working for me and i can't relate to the brands i want to work with if i'm some number under fluorescent light in a cubicle mm -hmm. right so one it was getting out of an atmosphere that wasn't conducive to me growing and then two I'm surrounding myself with the right people. So I have a mentor right now, Vito Lafada, who's sorry, Vito Lafada, who's very successful, but it's getting the right mentors in place that you can learn from. It's rubbing elbows with creatives like you and Andre and others so that I'm sharpening my sword. Mm -hmm. And then it's also, what am I doing on my own time to get myself better? Am I reading books? Am I studying newsletters? Yeah. Am I looking at the late great people in copywriting? who do this thing way better than I could ever imagine <laughs> and stealing. So one of the biggest things for me has been creating what's called a swipe file, which is essentially a file of copy that gives me inspiration. How do I do that? I join the right newsletters. I scour blogs. Even when I'm watching TV, I'm pulling quotes from shows and movies <laughs> that, is awesome. that I can work into my copy, right? It's pretty incredible stuff. And literally it's a Google doc. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's about 25 pages. I'm hoping to someday flip it into a newsletter that I actually sell, like a monthly swipe file other yeah. writers can buy. But for now, that is probably my biggest continuing education. And it's crazy because the brands I follow for fun in my personal time will look at Barstool Sports. I'll watch their video, a video, one video, yeah. and I'll pull five or six things I can work into really? copy like that. Yeah. it's So for me, it's the swipe file. It's the people you surround yourself with and the mentors. And then it's also your mental health, which for me meant getting out of corporate and being in an atmosphere where I have control and I feel like I'm really in the driver's seat of my life and my business. Yeah. No, that, that's awesome. Very similar to all the things that working on as well. The, the swipe file, that's really cool. There's uh, actually a newsletter that I just stumbled on that what they do is kind of pull other people's ads and just give their two cents on it. It's almost similar yes. where it's like you're, you're building, you're compiling all these different um, types of copy and then just giving your two cents. And it's like, I mean, one, there's so much that you can do with that. But if, if you're going to turn around and monetize it, I think that's uh, that's huge. Well, and if you look at for me, it's kind of a sports reference. Mm -hmm. I was a basketball guy. You were a baseball guy. You can't just go a step up to the plate and hit a home run, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you're warming up. You're in the batter's box swinging. Yeah. Basketball, I can't just go in and nail a three. I've got to be working on that. And frankly, I still probably can't, but I got to be working and working and working. My swipe file is the same. It's the warm up for my writing. So I go in there and I start getting inspired. I start getting creative. Mm -hmm. I start finding things that can influence what I'm writing about. And then suddenly you get in that flow state and the writing comes more natural. Um, so again, I equate it to a warm up. I, I love it. I mean, I, I love all the sports analogies. I, I get it like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I see you nodding like, yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. So, I mean, uh, before we kind of wrap up and, and kind of get some advice, is there anything that we didn't touch on that you were really wanting to tell the world? Um, I would use the story of us crossing paths. Mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting one of we had a mutual friend. Yeah. I posted something on Instagram, just letting people know that, hey, I'm on my own now. I left Petco and I'm building my business. I didn't need any leads or sales from it. It was just kind of this moment of I need to start putting myself out there because yeah. someday I am going to need leads yeah. and sales from it. And we crossed paths. We talked Thursday on a Zoom call. It's Saturday. I flew in from California for other reasons, but we're yeah. here, we're yeah. filming, it's 9 a.m. It's a testament to you guys for being willing to get up and come in on a Saturday <laughs> and do this. And then also it's a testament to that networking piece. Mm -hmm. Like this wouldn't have happened if we just weren't proactive and networked. Yeah. So I think whether you're a copywriter, a videographer, 
an editor, whatever you're doing in the marketing space, like be willing to network mm -hmm. and also speed kills. We made this happen in 48 hours. I, huge <laughs> proponent of speed kills. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, yeah, strike while iron's hot. Yep. I think, uh, yeah, being proactive. I, I mean, I love all of that. Are you planning on putting more out there? Because I, I, I saw Chase's uh, uh, post and I was like, oh, well, what's he all about? And then I looked and you mentioned in in uh, the story, I think it was or your post, that this is the first time that you're kind of, you know, posting about business related, that it isn't, you know, just personal, uh, private type of stuff. Are you planning on posting more of that type of content? What was the feedback like? Well, look, I've been lurking in the shadows of these big <laughs> brands. Like I'm hiding behind Slim Jim and Petco uh -huh. and people like that for a long time. And it took a moment of me realizing, wow, you've done some big stuff and you can do this on their own on your own to start getting comfortable, like coming out about this. Mm -hmm. And it's not a crazy big reveal. It's not politics. It's nothing like that. But it's just having my truth of I'm damn good at what I do. Yeah. I'm now taking this into my hands. And if you want to work with me, here's how it goes. So yeah, I'm planning on putting myself out there more. Yeah. I'm excited for a few clips from this podcast oh, yeah. to put myself yeah. out there, right? Um, but it's also for me, you know, and a lot of copywriters struggle with this. They can write great magical copy for anybody but themselves. <laughs> that's that's everything. And that's a challenge. And it's also another business challenge of what's the audience? So for mm -hmm. me, my audience right now is my friends and family. People don't know that I've wrote some of the biggest campaigns in the world. They yeah. don't know that I just pretty much led a rebrand for one of the biggest companies in the world. Yeah. They don't know these things and I can't always talk about these things. So how do I relate to my audience in a way that's also good for my business and true to me? And I'm still figuring that out, yeah. but being on something like this and chatting with you, getting some videos cut up from Andre, things like that allow me to do that. And yeah, I need to continue to put myself out there and I will. Do it hundred percent. It'll lead to so many opportunities exactly. and yeah, it's tough at first, but once, once, uh, you know, the, you get over that fear and the opportunities start coming in it just, it, it almost, it gets much more fun. Well, and you know, you said something too, you're like, what was the reaction? The reaction was I told people, I literally told my friends and family, if you don't want to follow me anymore yeah. and you don't want to hear about this, go ahead and mute me or cancel yeah, me or unfollow. Yeah. I mean, I did look, I had two unfollows. I don't know who they were. It was probably like spam accounts. Yep. But at the same time, I'm like, I need to build an audience that wants to learn from me yep. and wants to buy from me and wants to work with me. And that's not my friends and family because those aren't people running one to $20 million businesses. Yep. So for me, it's gotta be less about what do I have right now and where am I trying to go? And I'm slowly getting over that hurdle. Yeah, no, it's tough. And as we, as we wrap up, I mean, for businesses that are trying to figure out their copy, like there's a lot that that is great in here. The psychology, the testing and all that for those that are just trying to figure it out. What's the one biggest piece of advice that you'd have for them as they just kind of move forward from here? Learn your audience, spend time understanding your audience, interview people who have bought from you, understand how they talk and speak like them. If you don't want to write the words yourselves and you can't write mm -hmm. the words, talk to your audience, you get testimonials, you use their language and their questions to influence your content. But the more you understand them, the better. That's why people with common interests get along. That's why you and I hit it off. Mm -hmm. We understand each other. That as a business owner is what you have to do. And it doesn't matter what you're selling. Yeah. And that is very difficult to do while trying to run a business. So if someone goes, I don't even want to deal with that. How can they reach out to you? Yeah. Hire me. <laughs> so if you need help with that, Here's the thing. My wife calls me the speakeasy of copywriters because I'm like the secret <laughs> weapon that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. I've been hiding behind these big and small brands for so long. I've never put myself out there. I'm lucky enough that my name, Clay Manley, is a brand in its own because no one else is named Clay Manley <laughs> except for like someone's dog on Facebook. <laughs> so for me, I am the brand. For now, reach out to me via Instagram at Clay period Manley, M-A-N-L-E-Y. Hit me up. Like I said, I think speed kills. We'll have a conversation. We'll see if it's the right fit. If you're not doing one to 20 million or it's not the right fit, I've managed over 200 writers. So yeah. I have a network and I may be able to put you in touch with the right people. And if I am the right guy, we'll find a way to crush it. I absolutely love it. So don't don't hesitate to reach out. He'll get back to you quickly. And uh, Clay, I can't can't thank you enough for your time. I know you're down here for a wedding and everything and to, to make time to come in here on a Saturday. Can't thank you enough. Well, look, this was the highlight of the weekend. <laughs> and, um, you know, we got the wedding later today, probably crush a few beers. Maybe I'll text you and be like, man, this was awesome. Hit up Andre. But I had an absolute blast. Um, for those who haven't been here, this office is freaking awesome. <laughs> thank you. I was telling you guys, like, 
I'm about like the true creatives. Like you guys are true creatives. There is <laughs> sinks over here. We got a crazy light lighting this up. We got things that we don't even know what they're called on yeah. the shelves. We got disruptive on the walls. I mean, this place is awesome. So I love what you've built. Glad we got to connect. Shout out Chase Barbier for being our <laughs> mutual friend. Um, but yeah, this has been a blast. Awesome. Thanks a ton. Thanks, brother.